Well, the claim that all skeptics about Darwinian uh, orthodoxy or Christian fundamentalist stands refuted by me. It's obviously not true. I'm not, neither Christian nor a fundamentalist. Um, but lots and lots of people are skeptical in the scientific community. Uh, I know dozens of mathematicians who scratch their head and say, you guys think this is the way life originated? It's absolutely a preposterous theory. And many, many very significant figures. John von Neumann, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, just laughed at Darwinian theory. He hooted at it. Uh, so it's, it's perfectly absurd. This is a point in a polemical dispute. It's not a, a reasonable um, standard of criticism. Opposition to Darwinian theory is, I wouldn't say widespread, but there's a consistent group of people among mathematicians, among physicists, among some um, very good speculative biologists who simply don't, uh, don't accept it, don't, e don't even regard it as a scientific theory in any reasonable sense. Look, the stuff about uh, finch beaks is certainly interesting. Let's, let's not um, uh, confuse ourselves about that. Um, the question is, can it be extrapolated, or does it represent cyclic variation? Um, I can say, here's an account of how the eagle flies. Look, I get up, I jump in the air, I flap my hands a couple of times, and I land a few feet from where I started. Thus, the origin of flight. Uh, the obvious response is, this is nutty. You can flap your hands as, as long as you want. You won't fly like an eagle. Um, the argument from extrapolation can work in some circumstances. It fails in other circumstances. Plainly, in the case of a human being who jumps two feet in the air and then lands two feet from where he started, the argument from extrapolation fails. What persuades you in the case of the Galapagos finch that what seem to be cyclic variations are the start, the commencement of a grand uh, process of speciation? That's a step in the argument that has to be completed. It's not enough to say, well, it's more of the same. It's not more of the same self-evidently. It can easily be bounded variation of exactly the same sort as we see in any species experiment. Now, the contrary may be true. We may be seeing the development of entirely new species. The Galap Galapagos finch starts off as a finch, and uh, within 100 million years there'll be a Galapagos elephant. Could be. But we need a whole lot more by way of evidence than a couple of uh, nutty journalists going down there looking at finch beaks and uh, writing a Pulitzer Prize winning book. A whole lot more of this is to be serious science. I mean, this doesn't even pass the threshold of anecdote. Uh, finch beaks change in size. Yeah, they do. They change in shape, too. It seems to be correlated with seasons. It seems to be a regress back toward the mean when the seasons change again. If this is the part of a spectacular evolutionary extrapolation, let's have additional reasons for thinking that. Otherwise, we're not even talking about a scientific hypothesis. I imagine that uh, Juan Luis Borges, the famous writer, was offering an account of the origins of every contemporary novel. And uh, as is wont, um, he, he argued that all novels are really one novel, that is Don Quixote, and that all novels would, were derived from the Quixote by random copying changes in an obscure group of Cistercian French monks. Um, when I wrote that, I wanted to poke fun at Darwinian theory, but the more I thought about it, the more it seemed perfectly reasonable that that should be the account of the origins of the novel. Uh, you began with Don Quixote in the 15th century, 16th century. You had groups of monks who didn't speak any Spanish, didn't speak any French, uh, copying it, as medieval monks, uh, monks copied the Bible, and they introduced copying errors. And sure enough, after a certain amount of time, Don Quixote changed to War and Peace. Uh, different language, different notation, different elements, um, but essentially a process of copying and copying errors. Um, if we find that preposterous, and I certainly do, a little shiver could, should go up our backs when we think of the analogous, an analogous claim being made in the context of biology. We're asking for standards of behavior that it would be uh, wonderful to expect, but that no serious man actually does expect. A uh, hundred years of fraudulent drawings suggesting embryological affinities that don't exist. That's just what I would expect if biologists were struggling to maintain a position of power in a, a secular democratic society. Let, let's be reasonable. We're all sophisticated men and women here. I mean, the, the, the popular myth of science is a uniquely self-critical institution and scientists as men who would rather be consumed at the stake rather than fudge their data I mean, that's, that's okay for a PBS special, but that's not the real world. That's not what's taking place. I mean, people fudge the data whenever they can get away with it. 
uh, and they, they will uh, commit themselves to fraudulent drawing just so long as they're convinced that no one's looking over their shoulder. And it's, it's unrealistic, unsophisticated, and unwise to expect people to do anything other than that. Think of your last traffic ticket. Yeah, you bet, officer. I was doing 98 miles per hour <laughs> in a 30 mile an hour school zone. When was the last time you told the cop that? And yet we expect the biologist to say exactly the same thing about uh, drawings which have been his stock and trade for the last hundred years. The much more relevant question is how, how is it that we live in a society where uh, the point of view, the splendidly cyn cynical point of view I'm adumbrating right now is not common wisdom and we don't look more closely at what these people say. Well, well, the idea that, that the scientific enterprise is, is governed by a majority of opinion, it's not entirely a foolish idea. I mean, we can't, we can't get rid of it uh, completely and say that the truth is so unassailable that it can be discovered by one individual uh, inevitably running against uh, the tide of every other individual. There has to be some consensus and some points of view of science. Um, and, and to suggest that the fact that so many biologists are willing publicly to endorse Darwinian theory is of no account is foolish. Uh, to a certain extent, I do agree with that. It, it is important to present uh, within an educational uh, establishment what is the standard, the mainstream, the canonical view. There's, there's no question about that. But at the same time, for heaven's sake, let's open up the discussion a little bit and present some countervailing views. At least to the extent of, of um, appraising Darwinian theory, um, in the context that realistically portrays it for what it is. A kind of amusing 19th century collection of anecdotes that is utterly unlike anything we see in the serious sciences. That would be my favorite position. Um, yeah, biologists do agree um, that this is the correct theory for the origin and, and um, diversification of life, but here are some points you should consider as well. One, the theory doesn't have any substance. Two, it's preposterous. Three, it's not supported by the evidence. And four, the fact that the biologists are uniformly in agreement about this issue could as well be explained by some solid Marxist interpretation of their economic interests. That would satisfy me. It's not asking for much, is it? Don't be surprised when you hear the following statements from evolutionists in the coming year. Only people with a religious agenda oppose evolution, Evolution is a proven fact. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. If you doubt evolution, then you have turned away from science. All scientists agree that evolution is true. All these statements are overwhelmingly false, as Dr. Berlinski would say. If you start to be taken in by the propaganda of the evolutionists, just remember what Dr. Berlinski had to say as a non-Christian. The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. 1 Corinthians 15.45